Okay. We are live. Welcome to Conversational Currency, Maryland's top small business talk show. I'm your host, Shad Didi Laser. Ladies and gentlemen, communication is a superpower, and Conversational Currency examines the value and importance of social skills for business in the digital era told through the stories of today's business and thought leaders. Now, through the story of our guests and current events, we will answer the question, if you were able to say the right words in the right moments to every man or woman in a business setting, how different would your life be? Now, success starts with seizing opportunity. And right now is your chance to grab the digital assets execution plan, which is your step-by-step -step guide to package your skills and create digital assets to escape the time for money trap. Your next step is to browse mrshadi.com forward slash assets and claim your free plan. Now, in this conversational currency exclusive, you will learn the art of high ticket freelancing. Now, there's a lot that I may be able to share and explain about sales, but I had to go all the way to the Dominican Republic and reach out to not only an outstanding family man, not only a phenomenal public figure who gives phenomenal value online, but the expert behind several of the top websites around the world, I bring to you the great and talented Jose Rosado. Now, please <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit about your journey in terms of we all have had our start, Jose, but uh, you've been a web designer for 10 long years plus. How did you know that freelancing was the career path for you? Bro, you have the coolest last name ever, Elaser. Sounds like a, sounds like a movie, man. If, <laughs> like the main character, the hero of, a, of an action story, Elaser, in a theater near you. Love it, man. Um, you know, you just wrote my my biography for me. I'm going to listen this to the to this podcast after we end this and I'm going to like copy paste everything you said to me. <laughs> and I'm going to paste that on my website because you know um my biography is one of the things that I've struggled for so much to write but you just made you just wrote it for me. <laughs> so thank you for that my friend. Thank so you. um I cannot say, man. Thank you so much for that for that introduction. It actually caught me off guard. So let me tell you a little bit about my journey before we we start getting into the nitty gritty of how you can succeed as a freelancer or as a, or as an agency owner, which is something I believe any freelancer should strive for uh, as time passes by. So I began designing websites uh, around ten years ago here in the Dominican Republic because I realized that my career, graphic design, was going to keep me broke, okay? So I noticed from the get-go that I made a huge mistake to start studying graphic design in, here in DR. Um, and even though some people have found success in that career, <laughs> um, I can tell you that in DR, it's very hard because like minimum wage is really, really low. When I first started as, uh, as a web designer, I got a job for like $300 a month mm -hmm. around 10 years ago. That's how, how, how much is 300 times 12? I don't even know, man. It's so low. Let's see. Uh, don't do math live, man. It's like $3,600 a year. That's, mm -hmm. that was my salary when I started out. By any means, this is way below poverty line in the United States. Mm -hmm. Here in the Dominican, Dominican Republic is also near near that, okay, near the poverty level. Um, but the fact is that, thankfully, I realized <laughs> that 
I was better off maybe making money outside of a nine to five job, mm. especially when I, when I began as a, as a graphic designer, then web designer. Um, I discovered web design in, I think it was Facebook or something like that. I read a, a publication of this guy that offered classes of, of web design. And as a graphic designer, I said to myself, how much different could it be designing logos, layouts, books, ebooks, or whatever from designing websites? And I realized that the fundamentals are very similar, okay? Um, and I basically forced a friend to start to go to, to that class with me, okay? And I did that out of fear of, of actually failing. I told him like, hey, dude, let's do this together. Um, let's motivate each other to start with this web design class that we, I saw this on Facebook, or I think it was High Five back then. I don't even remember. And he said, yes. Ironically, he was the one that quit. I didn't. And now I'm the one designing, as you said, the best websites in the world. I don't know, man. I'll sh I'm, I'm, I, I haven't designed so many websites, like a hundred something. That's a lot, to be honest. It's just, I'm just being humble here. Anywho, that, that career of web design and migrating from graphic design to, to web design was the best decision ever. Hmm. Not only for the financial, um, of course, encouragement, but also I've been able to meet so many people from throughout, from, from, from the world. Because as you know, if you don't have a website, you don't exist. <laughs> At least that's what some people say um, to avoid taking action, you know? Anywho, I began, to, I began this journey of web design um, 10 years ago, and I had no idea what to do with it. So as any beginner, I started to throw like, uh, how, how, can, how can I say this word? Um, flying kicks to see if I landed anyone. And as yeah. you know, a flying kit, it, it looks great in movies, but mm -hmm. <laughs> in reality, that's like the worst kick you can ever throw in, in, in a mixed martial art event, for example. So I just started throwing flying kicks to see if I landed anyone. And I didn't, I didn't, because I was just basically starting out with freelancing and we're trying to make an income uh, with freelancing, web, uh, web design freelancing. So I was thinking about quitting, but then, but then I realized, Jose, you've been doing this wrong. Instead of trying to persuade um, people who have no idea who you are to buy from you, <laughs> start sending emails to your family members, to people around, the people that know you. Ask your dad, this is me talking to, to myself, ask your dad if he knows someone who needs a website. Maybe he can, you know, do some some of the, the work for you to, to get that client. So I started approaching all of these people that, that knew me. Um, and my godmother was basically, was my first um, paying client. Uh, I approached her. I told her about what I was doing. Hey, hey Joanna is her name. I'm, I'm doing this web design stuff. I can create a website for you for, I think, $300, some shit like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she said yes. And that was like the, the most time I spent designing a website because I wanted to over the liver. I remember we didn't even have um, WordPress as we know it today. WordPress is a content management system. It's, it's basically what manages all of the websites that you, that you visit. I think even New York Times uses, uses WordPress, I believe so. Um, I don't know if they change it, but I, I recall that they use WordPress to manage their, their content. We didn't have that as it is today. It was basically for blogging and nothing else. Today, you can use WordPress for way more than that. Thankfully, Joanna trusted in me enough to pay me. $300, well, was basically what I was making every month. Now, it was a little bit less than that back then. So I was very glad to get paid that much money for the first time in my life, okay? Mm -hmm. So what happened next? Um, I got the, the courage to start promoting myself a little bit more because once you do it once, well, that opens up the opportunity to do it more times because all you have to do is repeat what worked for you back then and make it a little bit better every time. That's the secret of success. Find what works for you, double down on it and make it better, make, it, make yourself more efficient, work less and get more and more results. That's what the meaning of, of being efficient in my, in my at least in, in my head. Anywho, 
then uh, I met Brenda, who is my wife right now. I was dating her back then, and he told, and she told me, I was like, um, my my friends from church need a website. Hmm. I'll tell them about you, and you then go pitch this thing for them. Um, by the way, this is not a free work because I'm not a believer in free work. I was willing to do the free work because I was in the process of wooing her, you know, and impressing her. And it was like, instead of giving her flowers, I'm, I was going to give her a website. <laughs> so um, I approached their friends. We had a meeting in her house and I closed the deal for like $500, some, something like that. I don't even know where these kids, kids got the $500. I just know I got paid. Um, I was 20 something back then, 21, 22. So this is basically getting getting paid and getting laid. <laughs> so I, I made sure that I, I delivered on that website. And it seems that I did a good job because I'm now married with Brenda and I have two beautiful kids. And now right. thinking about maybe getting a, another kid. We have two boys, um, Juan Diego and Javier Elias. I want a girl. So uh, let's see what happens. But you know, the thing is that once you, you start planning the, the gender of the kid, <laughs> it just goes the other way, um, which is okay. It's okay. Once you have the kids, you just want them to be, to be healthy. So that's my backstory. That's how I got started with freelancing. And I've noticed that as time passes by, the easier it gets to sell this service that I provide, not only because I can take the confidence I've been, uh, I've been able to develop throughout the years and like put it right now in the present, but also that I know, and here's a mindset thing. I know that if someone says no, I don't care. You're the one missing out. Okay. Here's how I think about client work. You don't choose me, like Mr. Prospect. I choose you out of the bunch. I go into what your website, I see what you're doing. And I say to myself, is this person... Um, worthy of my services? If yes, then send the cold email or the cold DM, direct message. If no, just ignore that company. That's how I view this freelancing thing or agency work. Because at the end of the day, what's an agency? You, you're just not working as a freelancer and you hire freelancers to do that for you or you hire people to do the thing for you uh, full time. Um, but in regards to sales, it's, it's basically the same thing. It's the process of getting someone to say yes to you, regardless of the industry in which you are, is the same. And we're going to be talking about that in a while. Anywho, back to the mindset thing. The client doesn't choose you. You choose them out of the bunch. You see if you can provide uh, them with your services by having a, an honest conversation with them. And if you find that you can solve the problems that they have, well, you proceed to pitch them your services. This works for freelancers. This works for agency. This works for if you're a coach, for example, if you're coaching people, the process is the same. You listen to the prospect, you see if you can solve the problem, and then you pitch your offers to see if they actually just really need it. Sometimes they, they don't, even though you might think they do. Anywho, uh, I'm just thankful for this a career that I chose, web design. I was able to meet a, a lot of people in the United States, in Germany, in United Kingdom, in Australia. And I've been able to, let's say, build a portfolio of websites and clients from throughout the world. Even though I live in a place where some people might consider a third world country, which is the Dominican Republic, right next to Puerto Rico, right next to, to Haiti really close to Cuba and really close to Jamaica also. So the internet has opened up so many opportunities for people from any part of the world, especially Latin America, which as you might guess, has really low wages, okay? That's just a fact. That's why people want to go to more, let's say more developed countries. If if that's not offensive, <laughs> because some people just find everything offensive today in a today in age, but I think I I I I can say that because I live in one of these developing countries. Anywho, um, the internet opened up so many doors for people who live in country like my own to make money online, 
to find people in other countries, to find people and prospect that can actually pay you way more than what you could get paid in your country. For example, I'll, I'll be 100% transparent here because I pride myself on, on, on doing that. The chances of me getting paid three, four, five thousand dollars for a website in Dominican Republic are really low. Really, really low. But getting paid for a website, a simple website with just with just the about page, who we are, a content, contact form, a newsletter, a connection or whatever, and getting paid that amount of money in other countries like United States, like um, UK, Australia, even Russia, whatever, it's way higher than here in DR. So I realized that I had to get over my fear of speaking in English <laughs> in order to pitch the services to people who were willing to pay me the money that I believe my services are worth. It was a very painful problem, a, a process. Because when you have this mentality that people might not be understanding what you're saying, <laughs> they can feel your nervousness, even though it's a phone conversation or a Zoom conversation. They can feel that from even through, uh, through, the, through the camera. They can feel that. They can sense it in how you speak, in how you, in how you um, pitch your services, in how you talk, in how fast or how slow you talk. Talk or all the filler words that you say, the ums, the mm, the the long pauses, which to this day I still struggle a little bit with the long pauses and with the ums and the filler words because I'm, I'm still trying to find a way to remove them in, in in English. In Spanish, mi hermano, yo te puedo hablar rapidísimo en español como si nada, porque es mi lenguaje, lo puedo hacer rapidísimo, and I know you're not understanding what I'm saying. Now you are, but in Spanish I don't have those struggles that I have in English. But I don't let that prevent me from achieving what I know I deserve, okay? Which is this freedom that I today have of being able to sleep in if I want, if I want to, to, to be able, today's my, 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 my kid's birthday, to be able to be with him. He's not at, at, at the house right now. He's now in, in a cousin celebrating some stuff. Then I'm going to pick him up and go to the park and have some quality time with him. Because I don't have the, the restrictions that a nine to five job might, you know, slap me with. So I deserve this freedom now. Now, even though I know I deserve this, I still need to put in the work to keep the freedom that today I'm privileged to have. I earned it with my job, with, with getting over my fear of, of speaking in English. I, I earned it with the with all the work that I've been able to put in because I want to provide everything my parents gave to me, to my kids and a little bit more. I was blessed with having great parents and with great grandparents. And I'm basically one of the few people that can say, my grandparents are all alive. I'm grateful for that. The four of them are totally alive, healthy and everything. My, um, my dad and my mother are together. They love each other. They, and it's, and you can see it. Okay. So I have that, let's say that goal of being like my parents, of being like my grandparents, people that actually overcame all of those struggles that come with being married with a person and mm -hmm. being able to raise good, powerful, respectable, and responsible kids, which today in age, as you might know, it's, it's different. I cannot say it's harder than before because today we have so many things, so many privileges, so many access to a lot of things that our parents, grandparents, and great grandparents didn't have. But the challenges of today are very different from before. Okay. So I'm not saying that it's harder or not. I'm just saying that I want to find a way to be able to overcome all of these challenges that modern society has <laughs> put in front of us to raise kids. And I want to make sure that I'm there for them. Mm. So how do I make that happen? How do I make that happen? I want to talk a little bit about sales with you. 
Mm -hmm. Basically, you are selling passively or you're selling actively. When you're talking about anything that happened in your life, when you're, story, you're, when you're telling a story about something that you find interesting, you are selling your lifestyle. You're selling your life choices. You're selling, well, that story that happened to you, that event that happened to you. Maybe you're doing it without the intent of someone buying something from you, but still you're doing it with the intent to entertain someone or just to have a good time with someone else. So you are, in that case, selling in a, in a very passive way, having a conversation with, with your peers, with your um, family members, with your friends, with your acquaintances. Now, I'm in the business of selling actively and prolifically because I've noticed that the more I pitch my, ser my services, the more I provide value to my clients and to my audience in Twitter and Instagram, the more I'm able to overcome any fear that I might have of failure the more my income goes up. And it's not about the income or the money that I make, which is, it's, it's good to make it. It's about what I can achieve with that money that I, I can, I can um, produce. Being with my kids, being able to pay for any emergencies that might arise, being able to provide for my family, being able to tell my wife, Brenda, look, uh, you have been working from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. every day for the last year because you have a nine to five job and you also have your music academy. Isn't it time for you to quit your job, for you to focus on your academy, which is your dream? And then she says, yes, because she's confident that with my skills and her skills, most her skills, of course, um, she's able to keep up with the demands of our lifestyle. I can make that happen. She can make that happen because both of us are putting in the work. Now, this is, this is not a conversation about freelancing. Freelancing is the least of your worries. It's a conversation about selling your services, about selling your lifestyle, about selling the values that you have. In the end of, at the end of the day, everything is sales. Everything is persuasion. You're either participating in the game actively or passively. People who are in the game passively have, they struggle a lot. Then they become eat the rich, <laughs> you know, eat the rich, uh, raise your taxes, people, which that's okay, man. If that's your mentality, that's okay. But why wouldn't you actively p play in a game that is, well, it's not meant to like help you out as, as much as it should. It's better than anything we'd had in the last century, man. Our great-grandparents were fighting in the war. They were killing each other. <laughs> Today, well, we still have some of that, but it's not like before. The game is easier today. It's not easy, it's easier, <laughs> which is not the same. Hopefully people can, are smart enough to make the distinction. Anywho, how do you sell? How do you make sure that people pay you for your services? How do you make sure that people are persuaded into trusting you, which is the first step to getting paid. How do you make sure that someone that doesn't have an, any idea who you are says, okay, let me take out my credit card. Let me block this so you don't see it. And let me swipe it. Let me swipe this credit card, even though I don't know who this person is, but this person has gained at least enough trust for me to swipe a credit card and pay that person $5,000, for example, just to put a, a number in it. How can we achieve that? Here's the secret. You do that by having honest, thoughtful conversations with people. If you ever hop into a sales call, all you have to do is ask questions. That is sales. You ask them about their current situation. You ask them about the struggles that they've been through. You ask them about why they haven't been able to achieve some of those goals what has worked, what has not worked. And you dig deep on why they want to fix this. And I see sales as an onion. And I'm, I'm going to steal an idea that I, 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 I heard from a friend. His, I cannot say his name because he's uh, semi-anonymous on Twitter. But I'll say he's pseudonymous. Um, Rogue Wealth, at Rogue Wealth on Twitter. 
And he presented me with this idea of sales, which to me is the perfect analogy. When you approach someone, you start talking with that person. And the first thing they'll say is about the, that outer layer of the onion. They'll say, I have this technical problem. That's the outer layer. I can't, my Facebook ad sucks. My Facebook ads has a return on adding, uh, spend, uh, spending of one, and I want it to be two or, two or three or four or whatever. My website loads really slow. I don't have a way to attract fans on Twitter or on Instagram. I'm bleeding money. That's very technical, okay? That's the first layer of the onion. What you want to do is drill, drill that onion until you find what that technical problem is provoking within that person. The emotions. You want to find that emotion. That's the job that you have as a salesperson when you're having an honest and thoughtful conversation with a prospect. And you do that by asking deep questions and then following up. Very simple. Let's put an example. So the prospect tells you, oh man, I'm struggling with my Facebook ads. They're not converting as much as I want. I only have a 1% conversion rate with my ads and I have a return of investment, um, ad investment of, of one. So I'm basically putting in a thousand dollars and making a thousand dollars. That's not good. And sometimes it's even low. I put in a thousand and I only make 500. Then you just proceed to, fo to follow up with a question. What have you done at this moment? Oh, I hired this company and they are very responsible. Okay. You tell them, and how does that make you feel? Oh man, I, it sucks. It worries me at night. Um, I can't sleep knowing that I'm bleeding this much money. You found the emotion. I can't sleep. I'm worried. And then you ask me, then you keep, keep asking more questions about uh, uh, all of the emotions that they are experiencing through. How has this affected your business? How has this affected your productivity? How has this affected the moral of uh, the morale of, of your company? And you start asking these emotional questions until they'll tell you about those emotions that they have. And then you ask them like, why do you want to solve this? They'll tell you because I don't want to bleed money. Bad answer. Then you follow up with more questions. Okay, and what will happen if you don't make your money back. Dude, I will lose my company. You struck for gold. How would, how would losing your company make you feel? Oh, blah, 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 blah. Why do you want to make your company succeed? Dude, I just want to provide for my family. I want to, I want to leave a lasting legacy. I want to know that I provided as much value to my, to my customers, to my um, employees. And I want to be able to buy that little house in the beach um, to go, I don't know, <laughs> during, during a winter when everything is cold here in Canada, for example, you struck gold. Once they, once they tell you about that, why? When you find that why they want to achieve something and when you find the emotions that all of that technical problem is causing them, you found the core of that onion that we were talking about a couple of minutes ago. And that's what, that's your purpose during that phone call. Once you're done with finding and discovering all of these emotions, all of these, um, prop, all of the emotions that that technical problem is causing within that prospect, then you proceed to pitch them with your offer. I have a very simple way to do this. Look, um, Mr. Elaser with the best um, last name in the, in the, in the universe. Um, I'm in the business of making, hap uh, making things happen for you. You told me about this goal of yours of purchasing that beach house. You told me about this goal of yours of making your ads work for you and increase the return of your um, ad in, uh, expenditures. You told me about the goal of being able to prove to, to leave a lasting legacy for your company. But you feel that at this very moment, the, the ads are not working to make, to help you achieve that. And you're worried and this causes you to lose sleep. So here's the deal. Then I just tell them how I can help them, help them achieve at least some of those goals that they tell me about. 
it makes it so much simpler to close the deal right there on the phone call. So you don't even have to wait to send them a proposal for you to get paid, <laughs> which is a big mistake a lot of freelancers and agency and coaches do. I'll send you a proposal and pay me when you feel like it. No, dude, you have to get paid on the phone call. That's how you do it. You don't wait. <laughs> no one opens a proposal. And if they say, oh, yeah, I need a proposal, you just tell them, okay, what would you like to see in the proposal? What they say there are all the objections they have to not buy from you right there. And then you just, would you, would you, do you, do you have a couple of minutes to talk about those things? Because would you prefer to have this conversation with a PDF or with me? Usually they say, oh shit, I didn't think about that. And then you just proceed to tell them, okay, here's what, oh, uh, it's great that you have this, this, this question. You reply to that question. You validate their feelings. You validate even the dumb questions that they ask you. Sometimes people ask you like really dumb questions to avoid even co continuing the conversation. But by asking follow-up questions, by validating their, the, the question or the dumb feeling or the stupid thing that they tell you, because sometimes it's stupid. I've been in the other side of the other uh, phone call. You cannot imagine how many stupid things I've said to someone. It's, it's normal. You validate their feelings because even though to you it might feel a little bit dumb or maybe like, ah, oh, that's like a dumb, a dumb excuse. For them, it is a real excuse. And you're there to answer to, the, to those struggles that they have and those questions that they have. And then you get paid on the phone. So this applies to any industry that you're in. Sales is asking questions and having an honest conversation with these people. And if you find that you can solve those problems that they have, then you proceed to pitch your services. What do you think about that? Hmm. There's a lot to unpack when it comes to your journey. There's a oh, lot. Yeah, to I, thank you so much for letting me speak like that, man. <laughs> Usually people interrupt and, and they don't let the other uh, person like um, uh, speak their mind. Thank you for that. Yes, welcome. And so I, I want to, to go into a, a few uh, root uh, points and values that you shared that uh, people often uh, miss. Here on Conversational Currency, we believe that family is the first business. And so being the leader of a family and putting the security, stability of the family on freelancing, which many people may consider as uh, unstable, volatile, and, and just up and down in some ways. Can you take us into the, the conversations that you've had in the household in terms of gaining the confidence of your wife to be able to go down this path and, and some of the challenges that even when you doubted yourself that help you to, to overcome that? Um, I've been blessed with, with meeting my wife, Brenda. I would not say like she's unique because anyone who's, who finds someone that they can say, wow, I was, I was blessed with this person will say the same thing. I'm not unique in regards to finding someone that uh, has similar values than you, has a great work ethic like you. So my, my, my story in regards to my, to my marriage is not unique. And, but what, what I can tell you is that I've been blessed with having a, a, a woman that I can say that I love, that I respect, that I, I'm able to trust. And thankfully, she can say the same about me. So I don't have to persuade Brenda on, on my life choices or on my decisions. When I first told her, like, Brenda, I'm going to quit my job to focus on my online stuff. She was pregnant with our second kid. So of course that caught her by surprise. And I told her like, I'm not asking for an opinion. I'm informing you just to make clear that I made my decision. Now I didn't go like, Brenda, this is what's going to happen. No, it was very respectful, but it was along those lines telling her that that was a decision. And I, I was informing her and I was telling, um, and I, was, I just wanted her blessing. That's all. I didn't need her blessing, but I wanted that blessing. So she's like, spent like five minutes in silence. And she said, 
Is that what you really want? I said, that is what I'm doing right now. And she said, go ahead, my man. Go ahead. You have my trust. Let's do this together. Hmm. So I don't, I didn't have to persuade her. Mm -hmm. She already like, she trusts, trust me enough to make that, that kind of decisions uh, by my own. And I trust her the same. She also has her business business. And I never, never like make, like force myself into her decisions. Sometimes she makes decisions that I, I don't not agree with, with her business. But I always tell her, even though I don't agree, it's your business. And I trust that you took that decision because you think it's the best even though it's not the thing that I would do. And magically, everything has worked for her. Not everything, but you, you understand what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So we have that trust between each other. And that's something that you build with time, okay? It's not something that she and, 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 and me had from the get-go. We developed that, that trust slowly and by having a lot of arguments, because that's normal in a marriage, by having a lot of tough time, by, by sometimes talking over the other person, sometimes having one of these conversations that you regret having, sometimes by saying stuff that you know that you shouldn't have said to that person. So we had a lot of those conversations that you regret after, <laughs> after the fact. But once you start trusting the other person, you stop having those conversations. I don't remember the last time I've had one of those conversations with my wife because we just decided like we're going to trust each other. That's it. We might not agree with the, the approach, but we're going to trust the other person's judgment. And that has worked perfectly for us. I don't remember the last argument I had with my, with my wife, <laughs> which is something I don't think a lot of men could say. <laughs> but that happened because we just started trusting each other. So I didn't Excellent. have to persuade her to, 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 to take the leap of faith. Excellent. Now, if you're just tuning into this broadcast, you are tuning into Conversational Currency, and we're having a discussion on the art of high-ticket freelancing and the, the journey that it, it takes to reach that level of awareness with Jose Rosado. Now, high-income skills is one area that, that many gurus and professionals talk about. And of course, you've had your progression with graphic design, going into uh, web design for the young man or woman who is, is tuning into this and they're at the beginning of their journey. Can you please share with us where do skills fit into the, the freelance equation? Skills, developing skills, your skills is how you become of value to this society. If you are an unskillful SOB, you're going to have a tough time in this world where value is everything, where competence is everything. And then you'll become one of, the, one of these um, resentful young man, young woman who hates everything. People call these people like the dark, um, the black pill people. They, they see dread and, and sorrow and darkness everywhere. If you want to avoid hopping into that realm of... <laughs> of awfulness, you need to develop your skills. Which skills? Whichever you want, dude. What do you like? Try it out for three, four, five months. Try to learn it. See if you, if you actually like it. If you don't, hop to the other skill. Now, the great thing is that those three, four, six months, let's say, that you invested into that skill, it's something that you'll keep forever. And you start building what um, author Scott Adams talks about a talent stack, hmm. which is a stack of all those skills that you have. And if you build skills that are compatible with each other, well, your stack is even better. And it raises your, your, your chance of, of success, however you define it. So in my case, for example, I started gra graphic design. That's something I've, I've used for, my, um, for Instagram and for you know, making things more visually persuasive, let's call it like that. Then I learned web design, which is one of my, my best skills because it's, it's one of the skills that pays me. Then I developed talking in English. 
English is one of the skills that I have that makes me the most money because I write in English and I get paid for writing in English and, and for providing value in English and for selling in English. And that takes me to the other skills, sales, which in my opinion is the most valuable skill that you can ever develop. Mm. Why is that? Because even if you don't have the web design skill or any other skill, photography, um, let's say that you study engineering or whatever, you can use sell, sales to sell other people's stuff. You can use sales to sell other people's products. You can use sales to persuade people into following you on social media because sales is about having a conversation with people. And if you, for example, if you go to Twitter, you can start having a conversation with a lot, with the world, basically, with just a couple of tabs on your, on your smartphone. So you start developing all of these skills and you start stacking them up. And if you can make sure that these skills are compatible, meaning that when they're together, they are more powerful than being by themselves, you become of more value to yourself, to your community, to the world. And once you start becoming of more, more value, the great thing, something great happens. People start noticing and then they start referring you. And then you don't even have to find work because people just talk about you all the time. That, what, that is what happens when you become competent at whatever thing you want. Dude, there's, there's a company called Potato Parcel, or, or Parcel, I don't know how to pronounce that word. They sell potatoes, engraved potatoes, for $20 mm -hmm. the unit. Okay. If, uh, if someone can sell an, an engraved potato, something that spoils like in two days, for $20, what makes you think you cannot get paid for your services? Heck, the Obama administration paying, I don't know, like a billion dollars for the healthcare.gov uh, website, some, something like that. What makes you think you cannot charge $5,000 for a website when the government paid a billion dollars, close to a billion dollars for that um, website? Think about that. Doesn't matter if you are a freelancer or an agency. If you can persuade someone into trusting you and you can assure them that you can help them achieve some of those goals that they tell you throughout the phone call that you have with these people, they will pay you. And there's something I forgot to tell you oh, a couple of minutes ago where people say like, oh, freelancing, that's, that, that'll keep you broke or whatever. And you cannot charge high ticket, high ticket uh, prices for your freelancing services. That's a lie. You can charge a lot of money for freelancing. And think about this. One client can pay for your full month of expenditures. That's all you need. One client that pays you four, $5,000. Because let's be frank. What's the medium income in the United States? Like $5,000? $6,000? Something like that? Mm -hmm. That's for working nine to, a nine to five job. Eight hours a day from La Monday to Friday. That's a lot of time to, earn, to make $5,000 a month. And we're not even counting taxes and all this, the stuff that the government takes away from you. You can make as much money with one client if you have the skills, of course, because it all, it, it all depends on the skills that you have. And you don't even have to be the best to charge high, high prices. You need to be, to be good enough and competent enough to deliver on your promises. That's the thing. You don't have to be the best. You have to deliver on your promises, okay? So one client pays the bills. Two clients pay for your dreams. Three clients, well, you start stacking up that cash, man. And then who knows? You can go for freelancing to being an agency owner and just delegate all of that grunt work to someone else. That's the process. It might take you months. It might take you years. It might take you decades. Who knows? But don't you owe it to yourself to figure out if this is the path that you are meant to be in? Not depending on a nine-to-five job, which is totally fine, man. If that's what you want, your what well, if that is what you want for your life, that's one hundred percent a great life decision. Now, if you hate that lifestyle, which is also okay. What's keeping you from taking the leap of faith? And you don't, you don't, you don't even have to quit the job to start freelancing. Hmm. 
all you need is one client. You don't, you can work that um, at 12 p.m. when you are having your break, or you can do that after five or 6 p.m. when you're at home. I remember when I was still like employed, I told my clients, look, I have a nine to five job. I told them. Oh. They knew I had a nine to five job. I never, ever um, abstain from telling my clients that they about that. Why? I don't want them to be calling me at, at 3 p.m. or 10 a.m. when I'm working for the other company. So they knew. Now I did tell them like, you can text me at any time. That's okay. So they had, we, we had an upfront agreement be, be, before um, them paying me. So you don't have to quit your job to, to start this process of freelancing or building an agency. You, all you have to do is be upfront with that, telling them what are your, your conditions. And remember, remember, they don't choose you. You pick them because you're going to do the, your, your research before pitching your services to them. You want to make sure that who you are working for, who you are providing value to, is someone that you want to help. Why would you help someone that you hate? Maybe if you're Jesus, you can do that. But let's face it. Mm, why? <laughs> I wouldn't. That's why Jesus is Jesus and I'm just Jose Rosal. Okay? So you decide with whom you want to work with. You provide value. You pitch your stuff. You talk with them. And you can do that at your spare, at your, in your spare time. Just make sure that they know when they can approach you or how they can communicate with you. Hmm. Now, we talk about the, the, the journey, the, the tangible journey. Walk with me here, Jose. There's a lot of freelancers that uh, service-based business professionals who start off very low ticket. Many, including myself, uh, had the belief that you had to, um, let's say, earn your stripes and, and earn your reputation. And uh, in many cases, work for free, which is something that you don't believe in. And uh, <laughs> so the question is, if you are the $9 freelancer, if you're the $27 freelancer, $47 freelancer, and you see this interview and they listen to you and they realize that, wait a minute, there is a bigger game to play here. This service that I've been charging for, there are people who are making uh, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. My question to you, Jose, is how does the $27 freelancer, what do they need to understand what light switch needs to come on for them to suddenly or gradually go to that high ticket reality? Talk to me. First, let's put a price tag to that high ticket. Okay. $5,000. Let's say $5,000. How do you go from 27 to 5K? <laughs> for a long time, I asked myself how to do that. I used to charge $500 for my web design services until I didn't. I raised my prices to $1,000. And once I decided to raise my prices to $1,000, I'm talking about a long time ago, not right now. That same week when I raised my prices by two, I closed two deals. That blew my mind. Of course, now, of course, we're talking about getting lucky. I got lucky that some people approached me because it was referral. But hear this. Why did they call me on a referral? Because I put the work. And someone who loved what I did for them referred me to these two people. So even though I got lucky in the sense that they appeared out of the blue, just when I decided to increase my prices, <laughs> I still put in the work, good work in such a way that I got the referrals. So how do you go from 27 to 1,000? Start charging more slowly. That's the first step. Now you're not going to charge $1,000 for, for a logo at first. So you start charging 50, then 150, then 500, then 1,000. 
And you don't even have to take a year to raise those prices to that point. That's step one. Start charging more money. Slowly, if you don't feel comfortable with asking such a high price as $5,000, because let's face it, not a lot of business people are willing to pay five, ten, I don't know, of how hundred thousand dollars for a logo. Some are, but that's a very tiny minority who pay you that amount of money for a logo. This takes me to the second, to the second most important step. You need to package your offers in such a way that the perceived value of that package feels more expensive than what you're asking to be, to get paid. So if the prospect feels that five thousand dollars is a worthy price for that services is because they actually feel like it should be higher. <laughs> now, how do you package that offer in that way? Let's talk about specifics here. Let's say that you are a graphic designer. Let's say that you design, I don't know, man, Instagram posts for $5 a piece. Instead of selling the individual post, package that um, in the following way. Now, of course, this is on your, on your, on, on what the listener, this is your decision, but I'm just giving you an example right now. Let's say that you help people growing their Instagram accounts by creating beautiful uh, Instagram posts. Instead of selling this for $5 a piece, say at first, okay, I'm going to build, I'm going to create um, 50, 15, 15 pieces for you a month. And I'll charge you um, $500 for that. That's how you get started. And you don't even pitch it like this, okay? You don't say, I'm going to build 15 for 500. You're going to have a conversation with these people and you're going to understand what they need because maybe they need 30, one a day. Oh, and then you say, okay, that's a great, that's a great number. Why do you want that, that amount? Why do you need that? What is your mission with creating these posts? Who do you want to attract? What's the feeling that you want to provoke in these people when they read those posts? Why do you want to provoke these feelings on them? And you start having a conversation with them. Then you proceed to make the pitch. So I'm in the business of helping you achieve that goal that you told me and that you feel that you're not able to achieve because you lack the, the graphic design skills and you've tried it before, but the last graphic designer you had was not the best one, whatever. So here's what I can do for you. I'll design the 30 pieces for you every month. And if I fail to deliver, I'll give you your money back and I'll buy you a, a coffee. For like, if I fail to deliver on time, all of that will be $700 or $750 per month. And that's how you get started. Then you start gaining that trust from that client and other clients. And you start slowly and steady increasing your prices and packaging that offer in a better, more persuasive way. And it takes me to point three. How do you build a very persuasive Let's call it an offer. How do you actually achieve that? Especially when you're having a phone call with the, pro with, the, with the prospect. Well, this is what I learned from, there's a, a company called Traffic and Funnels. I paid $10,000 for a coaching that they gave me. That's a lot of money, especially here in the Dominican Republic. I had never spent so much money. That's a lot of money, man. That's 600,000 pesos, okay? You can buy a car with that. Uh, a very good car here in the Dominican Republic. And I paid that much money for a training. And this is one of the things that I actually got from the training. You need to build the success pillars of your services. The success pillars is nothing more than a couple of words, let's call it like that, that paints an image of success in your prospect's mind. And how do you paint that picture? Well, First, you need to understand the problems that your niche is having, your, the industry in which you're selling your stuff. The, that's the niche. The little tiny sector within another industry, within another industry that you decided to, to, to serve, okay? You understand their problems. And you detect which are, let's say, the three most awful, painful my, like my, mind 
shattering problems that they have. And you turn that into a positive. Let me tell you how you do that. I was talking with a friend uh, the other day on Twitter. He is a fitness coach. And he told me, oh, I'm just charging $600 for 12 months of, of coaching. And I told him, dude, that's all. $600 for three months of coaching? Like, you're, you're going to go broke. Charge $1,000 a month. Here's how. Success pillars. I asked him, what are the main problems that you have with your, with your prospect? Oh, they, um, they have the problem with their diet. They don't know how to lift. And uh, the consistency, let's say. Th those are three problems. Diet, consistency, and, and gaining strength. I turned that into success pillars. I turned the problem of dieting into the next pillar. Easy diet. I've noticed that my clients who achieve success follow these simple principles. Principle number one, they have a simple diet. I help them create a diet that they actually enjoy without removing the Oreos from their, from their diet. Because I'm not in the business of making you suffer with what you eat. I teach you how to eat the things that you like in such a way that you don't gain weight. Now, can you see how I turned that painful problem into a success pillar? By diagnosing these very painful problems and turning them into the success pillars of your service, and by telling your prospect about these success pillars, you actually create that image of success and you convey the value, the real value, and the benefits of your service. Let's go back to the pillar number two of that fitness thing. Um, I'm not strong enough. I don't know how to lift. Um, it's too hard, whatever. Okay, that's pillar number two. Um, strength gain, gaining strength, something like that. I, I, I forgot how I called it. Maximizing strength, something like that. I work with you one-on-one -on -one to show you what are the best lifts to gain muscle mass without injuring yourself and without feeling that this is too heavy for you, which motivates you to go to the gym. And then we have pillar number three. Um, whatever, whatever, I forgot. And I can assure you by doing that, you're going to get people to agree to that $1,000 a month instead of $600 for 12 weeks. This is what I did with my own coaching. I started at $500 with my one-on-one -on -one coaching for 12 weeks, one hour every week. That's 12 hours of work for $500. Let's do some math here. That's $42 per hour, which is still, it's way above minimum wage, but I made that with my information products easily, like very easily. <laughs> So why would I charge so low prices when I could charge more? Well, in my case, I didn't have the experience of coaching and I didn't have the content, the content for the coaching. So I started developing these, the content for these people that pay me $500. I closed like five people in that first day. $500, five clients, that's $2,500. And I coached them for 12 weeks. Some of them made their money back, some of them didn't because they didn't put in the work because sometimes some people just don't. And I grabbed all of that content and made it so good that now I charge 10 times that for less work, 12 weeks, 30 minutes a week. That's all you get. Because I built the foundations for me to be able to provide more value in less time. I'm more efficient in it. I, it takes less resources from me, from the client, and they achieve more success because I've created slowly and steady. I'm talking about, it took me two years to go from 500 to 5,000. Sometimes a little bit more than that, depending on the client and their needs. And I'm still underpricing my services. The one-on-one -on -one coach, I should be charging 10K, to be honest. But I don't do it because, you know, I, I, <laughs> it's a process. It is a process. I'm still in the journey of, of raising my prices each, each time more. It takes time. It doesn't, it doesn't come up in a week. 
Because at the end of the day, what do I want to achieve with my coaching? I wanted to make their money back as soon as possible without reducing the quality of their work. So that's how you, you raise your prices, slowly and steady. Start charging 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% more. You don't have to charge 100% more how I, like how I did with my, <laughs> with my web design services, but still from 500 to $1,000 is not even that big of a leap. Now, we're talking about 100% of 10,000, 200%, whatever, going from 10 to 20,000. That's a different ballgame, okay? <laughs> I'm not there yet, mm -hmm. so I cannot speak about that because I avoid speaking about the stuff that I have no idea about because all of this is recorded. And if I start talking out of my mouth, people will start finding all the bullshit mm -hmm. that I say. So I, I, I totally, I just never talk about the things that I've never done in my life because people will start finding information and just... I noticed that it's way harder to, to keep up with the lies than saying the truth. If you are a liar, you need to have a, a little notebook. <laughs> In this date, I told this person this lie. In this date, I told that person that lie. So when they ask you about that, you can like, oh shit. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's a lie. <laughs> you won't remember the lie. Mm -hmm. Especially because people usually invent the lies right there on the get-go. And they all come back to bite you in the ass. So avoid lying as much as you can. It's simple to just say the truth. Go back in time. I told you about how I told my clients, hey, I have a nine to five job. They respected the hell out of that. They actually trusted me more because I revealed that to them, which is something that a lot of people don't do. And then they start failing to take the calls that their clients do. They never reply to their messages. They never reply to their emails because they're too busy with a nine to five job. And then the client gets sick of the, of the, of the of you, the, the freelancer or the business owner or the agency owner. And then they go on Twitter and they'll, they say, this guy is a bullshit artist. He sold me on this and I paid him $5,000 and he never called back. And then you're fucked for life. Oops, sorry for the bad word, but that's the reality. Mm -hmm. One bad testimonial from a disgruntled person can mess your business forever. It's a risk that you're taking when you're doing this. But if you're willing to put in the work and actually deliver on your promises, you won't have these kind of people pursuing you. You might, but it's really low low chances if you do, do your job. Hmm. Now, let's talk about the, the, the foundations for a, a second. Now, we have a... a a scenario called the, the time for money trap, where we have when you exchange a service for income and you're working on projects, when you're, those projects end, you have to find new clients. And many uh, freelancers who misunderstand uh, prospecting and cold emailing and so on and so forth often uh, struggle with this. And one solution is to create digital products. Now, can you please share with us how creating digital products has, uh, let's say, pushed your business forward, how it impacted who you work with, and just take us into the world of digital products uh, for freelancing and how it has helped you. I played many different parts online. I play the freelancer and I play the information product guy. I from time to time play the, the, the email marketing guy. And when I say I play, it's not that I'm acting. It's that I know I have different roles and different skills. And I just see each of these skills as a, as a part in, or, or as a play, let's say. And I'm the actor within that play. So let's switch a little bit. And right now I'm Jose Rosado, the information product guru, okay? I'm not a guru, but for the sake of the argument, let's just call it like that because that's how people call information products people, the guru. So Zero Salo, the information product guru, does the following thing. He writes down all of his ideas of how he achieves his stuff. Let's say he's what designs services. He writes all the process and he builds up information product with that and then he sells it. The process is very straightforward. If you're a freelancer and you have you, should, you surely have a skill. You document each of the steps that you take to 
achieve the success that you want for your clients. And then you sell that. That is the process of using your freelancing skills to write or record information products. An information product could be a PDF, a guide, uh, an audio note or whatever, or a video course, which are very, are very respected in the information product niche. Document everything. And what do I mean with document? You don't even have to sit down and, and, and write that down, all of that content in one sit, in one sitting. Every day you take 30 minutes to think about which are the steps that you take. Here's how. Let's imagine that we have a place called Hell Island. Then we imagine a place that it's called Heaven Island. You want to take your prospect, well, in this case, your information product buyer, from Hell Island to Heaven Island. Your info product is the bridge between Hell and Heaven Island. That bridge has different bricks that create the structure. Each of those bricks are a tiny little idea of your process that will take that person from Hell Island to Heaven Island. In my case, I built a course called Straight Line Web Design. It's my process of creating websites in WordPress and how to, how to buy all the stuff that you need to buy and how to construct a website from, from the ground up, even if you're not a graphic designer and without coding because I'm using WordPress for that, which is a blessing to the, <laughs> It does all the, the work for you, basically. Well, each of these bricks are one tiny step that they need to take in order to go from Hell Island to Heaven Island. How do you think about this in terms of, of real content, let's say? I imagine the following thing. That brick is composed of different stuff. You know, a brick has, let's say, what is a brick made of? How, I don't know how to say it in English. <laughs> in Spanish, we, we call it cemento, arena, but okay. I don't know how to say it in English. Mm -hmm. um, cement, I cement. guess. Yes. Um, a little bit of sand, I guess. It also has water, or at least you use water to, to, to create the stuff and more, more whatever. So each of these components that that little brick has mm -hmm. is one little step within that's a bigger step. So let's say step one that someone needs to, 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 to take in order to, to build their website. Well, they need to buy the domain name. That's step one. Within that step one, we have more tiny steps. You go to godaddy.com. You type in the domain name. Step three, you hit enter. Step four, you see if the domain is available. Step five, you click the Add to Cart button. Step six, you pay GoDaddy. Step seven, you change the DNS. Then we, talk, then we go to more deeper. How do I change the DNS? You, that's more steps within another step. So that's how I think about uh, building my own information products. It's like a like an organizational chart <laughs> where you have the CEO and then you have like, like the directors and then you have uh, the, the, the people that work for the director and stuff like that. So using this analogy, you can do the same thing. What's, what's step one? That's the first part of, the, of that little branch that you have there. Within that branch, you have more branches. Okay, and you start branching out and you start mm -hmm. writing and documenting all of those little, little branches within that bigger branch. Okay, so you can literally turn your skills into a, a PDF that you can sell for five, 10, 20. I've seen people selling PDFs for $100, man. <laughs> like really, can you imagine 10 years ago, someone paying $100 for a PDF? And I'm not talking about academic stuff because you know, in universities, you, you, how much does it cost a book? $500 sometimes? Mm -hmm. I don't even know. I don't live in the United States, but I know it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. But today, some people actually pay $100 for a PDF. People pay $500, $1,000 for a video course. I've seen people charging three, dollars $5,000 for a video course. I don't charge that much for a video course, but I've seen people making a lot of money selling at that price point. What makes you think that you cannot sell 
a PDF for $10. Some mm-hmm. people are selling it for $100. And you don't have to overcomplicate the process. I just told you, you take the guy, the person, that, the information product buyer f- from Hell Island to Heaven Island. Your product is the bridge between both places. I just told you how to do that. You put in the work, 30 minutes a day for I don't know how many days. You record that if you want to make it a video or you just print that into a PDF and you sell that for $10. And you can use um, Teachable. You can use Gumroad. You can use SamCart. You can use ClickFunnels. You can use any, any e-commerce site that lets you upload a PDF or load or copy paste some, some text onto a web page. That's the process. Now, a lot of people are just little bitches that quit and never put in the, never put in the work. Mm-hmm. You must not be that person. 30 minutes a day, 30, 60 minutes a day, it's even better. Document everything and then sell that information. Now, when it comes to the lessons that uh, you've, you've packaged into the freelance freedom framework, my question to you is, as you mentioned, you documented your process and you walked through very clearly how to create an information product. My question to you is after 10 long years in delivering so much value, what has packaging the freelance freedom framework taught you about the journey and reminded you about all the the ups and downs that you've been through in creating and finishing this course? Some context, freelance freedom framework is a course that I just launched. It teaches freelancers and agency owners, uh, for that fact, how to package their offers and how to pitch it and how to sell it and how to find clients that are willing to pay five, three to $5,000 for that service. I have this student. She is from India. Right now, she's living in uh, Ireland. And I coached her on how to conduct, for example, a very simple sales call. She got paid $8,700 for her services, three times more than her usual cost. Now, this is for a three-month service. Well, we're talking about $3, almost $3,000 a month for her content creation service, which she, she had never been paid that much money. She's a 21-year-old girl studying philosophy and English in Ireland from India. <laughs> Let, let, let that thing sink a little bit in. Kids charging more money than what I used to make in one year when I first started out. Remember, I made $200, $300 a month times 12. That's $3,600 a month, something like that. She closed three times that amount, almost three times that amount for three months of her work. And I'm talking three months. It's way less than that. The length of the project is three months. I took, yeah, I took my process, I wrote it down, and then I recorded some videos on how to achieve that. I detail like the sales funnel of a freelancer, how, like, the first thing is that you need to research the market, then understand the market. Um, It's not even that. The first step is actually selecting a niche, then researching that niche, understanding the market with some market research, then creating an offer that solves the struggles and problems that this market has. Um, Then add the deliverables of that offer because you need to deliver something, which is the promises that you're going to be making. Then you need to find people within that niche. Then you need to send cold emails or cold direct messages. Then you schedule a meeting with them. Then you have a sales call or a discovery call. And then you close the client. And finally, you deliver on your promises. And you repeat that process over and over and over again, and you will never struggle for money again in your life. Why is that? Because all you need is to close one client a month to make between three and $5,000 with one client. So instead of trying to pursue the low hanging fruit of people paying you $20 for your Fiverr services, dude, Throw yourself into the, into the three to $5,000 service as a biz. 
because all you need is one client a month. And I just told you the funnel. Now, how do you find these clients? There are many services that help you find emails from different companies and different industries. There's a, there's a guy I met on Twitter. His name is Daniel. Black Hat Wizard, I think is the, his handle on Twitter. He, damn, he sold the course that taught me how to, how to find these emails really fast. I used to do that manually, by the way. Um, and there I learned about something called IC Leads, icleads.com. That platform lets you find thousands of emails divided by industry and by company size. If you send 100 emails every other day, I can guarantee you that you will get a couple of meetings from these people. And from those couple of meetings, if you are able to convey the value of your services, you are going to get at least one sale. It's almost impossible not to get a sale if you have, let's say, 10 meetings, 20 meetings a month, which is, is low bowling it. <laughs> if you actually start sending cold emails, 100 emails every other day or 100 emails every day, which is done automatically by IC Leads. You write down some stuff and IC Leads will send those emails to these people automatically. If, this is what we call driving traffic to your offers in the information product um, niche. <laughs> but also for freelancing, it's the same thing. You drive traffic to your um, schedule. People schedule, book a call with you, and then you persuade them into buying something from you by, by conducting a great sales call in which you ask them about their problems, in which you have an honest, heartwarming, hopefully heartwarming, conversation with these prospects. And then you present them your offer in such a way that the perceived value feels less expensive than the money that you're asking for. Let's refer back to the success pillars. You craft the success pillars of your services. You tell those success pillars to your, to your prospect, and then you detail some of the deliverables of your service, and you can close the deal right there on the phone call. So get your Stripe account and have all the products created so you can send them the link right there on Stripe <laughs> and try to get freaking paid in the phone call, okay? So I detail all of that inside the freelancing, freelance freedom framework, which I should actually rename to something else because it's applicable to coaching. It's applicable for agency work. It's applicable basically to any industry that relies on sales because at the end of the day, any business needs to find clients. Why not use email for that? I see leads in this case that automates some of that, of that process. Then you have the sales call. Well, you need to understand how to conduct a good sales call. No matter the business in which you are, if you have sales, um, the freelance freedom framework actually teaches you how to close those deals on the phone call. Now, I'm not talking about a $100,000 deal. That, that's a different ball game. I don't have experience in that domain. Mine is five, six, ten thousand dollars. More than that, that's something different that I'm still working towards too. Okay. But if you want to learn how to do that, follow me on Twitter. You can get it for free at first. And then if you like what I do, hmm, buy my course. You can find me at, at Jose Rosal on Twitter or on Instagram at Jose Rosado HQ. Unfortunately, I cannot. The, the at Jose Rosado, I don't know who has it. And I can't, <laughs> he doesn't reply to my messages. I want to buy that from him. If anyone can help me buy the at Jose Rosado, man, uh, here's, how do you call this when you are like trying to find a, a thief and you, oh, you put out like a reward on the head of the person. <laughs> I'll pay $2,000 for anyone that can get me that at, at Jose Rosado, man. That's my reward for getting me that domain. 2K, easy 2K. If anyone can help me get at Jose Rosado on Instagram, man. <laughs> man, I, I, I wish I had that at Jose Rosado on Instagram. That's my dream at the moment. But the guy doesn't reply to my messages. You can't get any, You cannot get everything in your life, unfortunately. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, in this discussion, we have learned uh, several key pillars and principles, starting with the idea that family is the first business. And when you make a decision and walk that path, 
it can change your life. In the story of Jose, we've learned how to package your skills, how to create an offer, and also how to overcome what many people see as limiting beliefs, whether you are from a third world country, whether you speak English as a, a second language, and start to use your experience to start from where you are. And over time, through using your network, using friends, family, and ultimately challenging yourself to step up gradually to the next levels to become a high ticket freelancer. In your journey, I want you to ask yourself, where are you and where do you want to go? Whether you are on Hell Island or somewhere in between and you need to get to Heaven Island, I want you to ask yourself, what bricks are you building each day in order to reach that paradise that you and your family deserve. On behalf of the great and talented Jose Rosado, I am Shadidi Laser. You've been tuning in to Conversational Currency, where we examine the value and importance of social skills for business in a digital era. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you chose to be here with us. And for that, we appreciate you. Thank you for tuning in.